All right, so um, last week we were talking about three types of legal business ownership. Can we review that for a second? Just to kind of like refresh our memories for exam number two coming up in a couple of weeks, yeah? Um, okay, so what do you call it when one business owner owns the business, but there is no legal separation between the person and the business? Beautiful, good. What do you call it when more than one person shares responsibility to own the business? Partnership. Good job, all right. There are two types of partners. What does a general partner have in a partnership? A limited liability. Good job, oh my God, you guys. I am not gonna throw any shade on the Tuesday night class on camera, but <laughs> they need to pay attention to you all. Um, and what do you call a limited partner? What does a limited partner have? Limited liability, good, okay. So in a general partnership, all partners have ge have limited, unlimited liability, right? In a limited partnership, you've got one general partner and then all limited partners, okay? And then in a limited liability partnership, you have all limited partners, all right? That's something that you probably are gonna have to just review in your notes, right? General partner, limited partner, limited liability partnership, okay. And then what do you call it when one or more people own a business, but there is legal separation between the owners and the corporation? Oh, I just said it, corporation. Three types of corporations we learned last week, S-Corp, C-Corp, Nonprofit Corp. What's an S-Corp? Good, S-Corp does not pay off corporate tax. Okay, so are they cheating? Who pays tax in an S-Corp? Uh, not, well, sure, the employees pay, pay payroll tax, absolutely, just like you and me, but who pays it? The, the investors. The investors pay the tax, right? They bear the burden to pay the tax. Cool. How many investors can an S-Corp have? A hundred. Scared of you all. Up to a hundred. You got it. How about a C-Corp? How many investors can a C-Corp have? Unlimited. Unlimited. Beautiful. Why do companies want to be C-Corps? Good job to eventually go public. Yes, good. All right, and then a nonprofit corporation. What makes a nonprofit a nonprofit? That's true too. Yes, ma'am. How are they different from an S corp that doesn't pay tax? Uh, so eighty percent of the donations that they take in has to be spent on what? Doing good. No, doing good, you got it, right, on whatever their mission is, right? They're supposed to be doing something charitable or beneficial. Good, okay, cool. So we just reviewed sole proprietorship, partnership, and corporation, the three legal statuses that a company can take on. So this chapter is pretty much a continuation of that same topic. We're still talking about entrepreneurship, okay? So today I wanna give you guys some background on just kind of like what entrepreneurships are what types of them are getting started. What is the SBA? We haven't officially talked about the SBA yet. I wanna show you guys a two minute video today also about what does the Small Business Administration do for you, okay? So we'll look at that. All right, so first of all, can anybody tell me when our government says small business, what do they mean? So there's two things you need to know. When the government says small business, when the government defines a small business as small, by the way, my, I, I like to joke about my little dry cleaner, but my little dry cleaner on my block, a crazy man with a hammer attacked them um, and bashed out a window in this dry cleaner. And then he attacked another woman on the street with a hammer and he, he hurt her. Um, and then this morning I woke up and they caught him. He was like on the news this morning, it's crazy. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about them this morning. but. Um, a small business is small if it has how many employees? Who knows? Or what do you think? Fewer than uh, 500. Okay. What do you guys think? In your own minds, what do you think of a small business as? How many employees? 150. 100, good. What else do you guys think? Come on, I'm used to hearing answers like one, five, right? When you think of a small business, how many employees do you think of? 20, what do you guys think? 12, 
Cool, that was a random answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly a dozen, like a case of eggs. Um, okay, so yes, the answer is, and I hope it surprises you, the answer is fewer than 500, okay? So a small business is small if it has 499 or less employees. That's kind of shocking, right? Did you know that's because you reviewed? I reviewed you? that cheated. I love it. Good job. You know, cheating is good. Cheating is what I want you to do. Um, that's good. You prepared. So it should surprise you, right? Like, oh my God, the federal government defines a small business as like up to 499 employees, all right? So you may not realize that you are competing against other businesses that have up to that many employees. But there needs to be one other thing, okay? So let me just give you an example. Like when Twitter got started, Twitter, a social media network. Um, I don't know, Twitter may have had 50 employees, okay? But man, right off the bat, Twitter had a really massive influence on the industry. It was a major player right out the door against other social media platforms. So there needs to be two things. One is that you have to have fewer than 500 employees, but the other thing is the business cannot have a major influence on the market. So let me go back to my dry cleaner. So my dry cleaner, like, had it gone out of business, would that have had a major impact on the dry cleaning industry? No, it's just one of a million dry cleaners. I think it employs like four people, right? Part-time employees. So no, no major influence on the industry. Okay, so does anybody understand that? A small business is defined as small if it has less than 500 employees and it doesn't have a major influence on the market, on the industry it competes in on its, on its competitors. Okay. Next part of my slide, I'll be noticing, what's this blank space? Who knows the number one type, and by the way, you already know that most people employed by, uh, in the United States are employed by small businesses. We know that, right? We've said that many, many, many times. And by the way, remind me, so most people are employed by small businesses in this country, and what type of small business is the most common type of small business? What legal ownership? Sole proprietorship, which is really kind of scary, right? <laughs> Really kind of scary that more employees in this country work for sole proprietorships that have like unlimited liability, total legal responsibility. It's kind of crazy. But who can tell me, everybody, but you? Uh, Cause she's done. What's the number one kind of business started in America today? What do you guys think? So there's food service, there's wholesale, there's retail. They're opening a new liquor store on my block I'm kind of excited about. Total wine and, get, total wine and whatever, it's the big one, you know? Right here across from the brand new Starbucks that they just built on Oak Lawn and Congress, I'm excited. Um, although the Starbucks now has a drive-through and it backs up onto the street, it's so annoying. I don't know who's owned that. But, um, so what do you think? We've got wholesale, we've got retail, we've got um, food service. What do you guys think the number one kind of business started in America today is? Retail, wholesale, okay. Online. Online, online retail, okay. Those are good answers because from your own experiences here in Dallas, these are the types of businesses that you see starting up, right? What's that? You got it. You guys, 50%, half, half. Half of all businesses, new businesses started in America today are service-based businesses. These are businesses that do not physically sell a physical product, okay? Give me some examples. Give me some examples of businesses that don't sell a physical product that they put in a shopping bag or a box. Closet, Closet organizers, that's a specific one. Landscaper, what is it? Insurance, wedding planning, event planning, party planning. Uh, sure, any type of financial services. Janitorial. Um, cleaning, house cleaning, sure. Landscaping, dog walking, hair cutting, massage therapy, right? All of these things that you and I are more and more willing to pay money for so we don't have to do them ourselves. Why? Why is this the number one type of business started here? Why service-based businesses? So we already know. The United States is a service-based economy, right? We're not a manufacturing economy. We don't necessarily make a whole lot of stuff. Um, none of you are studying to be in an industry where you physically make, probably not. Some of you fashion designers may physically make. Most of you are probably gonna have manufacturing facilities make your products, right? Um, why? Why are service-based businesses the number one grower? Because it's quicker. Quicker? Is that what you said? Quicker, convenient, what'd you say? Uh, because labor is really expensive. Okay. 
These are good answers. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Do you all know? We're going to go over this later, but the number one most expensive line item in Part Seven A and B, right? When you go over your your capital and monthly expenses. The number one most expensive line item that you need to start your business, many of you, is what? Which one? Think about it. You're gonna open a retail store, even an online store, mostly a retail store. What do you need before you can open that retail store? Besides fixtures and equipment and that kind of stuff. What do you need? Are you gonna open an empty store? Have you ever walked into an empty store? I haven't, right? What do you need to start that business? Inventory. Inventory is often the number one most expensive line item on a budget to get a business started because you're not going to open your business with an empty store, right? right? So these businesses start with no inventory overhead. You guys get that, right? So oftentimes the startup cost is a lot lower. Get it? Because there's no inventory, all right? Sure, there could be all the other like um, upfront expenses, but there's no inventory. So that's why we see this like proliferation of service-based businesses started in America today. A, because you all are willing to pay for these services and B, because the startup cost is lower. Cool? Okay, question so far. Everybody understands what a small business is, the number one type of small business growing in America. Good. Okay, now, um, let's review the video from last week. We watched Amy's Ice Cream of Austin, Texas. She went from one to nine stores, I think, overnight, right? Um, what were the three big decisions Amy had to make? What was the first one we learned about the Amy's Ice Cream business? The location. Location. Where did she go? Austin. Austin, yeah. All nine stores, I think, are in Austin, Texas, right? And why, what did she say about a location? When you choose a location, what do you want out of that location? Obviously, you want your target audience to be there. But what else? Don't introduce a new product. Yeah, right? You want a location where your product makes sense and where there's gonna be demand for it. Um, her exact words were, you never wanna educate a market. That's very expensive. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean, educate a market? Bring in a new product. Yeah, you don't really want to necessarily have something that no one's gonna understand or have a need for and where there's no demand for it, right? Be like selling ice and you know ice to Eskimos, right? You always hear that silly say. Okay, what was the second thing? So location was first. Second thing was who remembers? Funding. Funding. Yeah. So where did the money come from? We're gonna actually have a slide about that in this presentation. Where does the money come from to start a small business? We're gonna talk about that. Where did Amy Amy's money come from? Our family shareholders. Family. Yeah, twenty-two family member and friend shareholders. Right. She took on twenty-two investors in the business that enabled her to get one and then nine stores open. And what was the third one? Structure. 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 What is the legal structure of Amy's ice cream? Sole proprietorship. No way. Grandma comes in and breaks her face in Amy's ice cream. They're not it's suing private. Amy. Oh, yeah. it's, a private. it's an S corporation. A private S corporation, right? So what does that mean? It means that um, all of the investors in Amy's ice cream get to share shares of the profit of the business. And they pay tax on that. Right? Where the business doesn't. Okay, cool. So here's the beauty of small business. Here's why the SBA is so into providing services and money, both loans and grants. They subsidize the loans that you might take out from a bank to start your business. Because small businesses create jobs. We've talked about that a hundred times in this class. Yes? Yes? The beauty of small business is that it creates jobs. Look at Sam Walton. Sam Walton, he started a little dry goods store. Where, I don't even know where, Arkansas, right? I think. You know who Sam Walton is? Walmart. Yeah, Walmart and Sam's Club, right? Walmart and Sam's Club. Sam Walton, Walmart and Sam's Club. How many people do Walmart and Sam's Club Corporation employ today? I don't know. Hundreds of them, millions, right? I mean, they're the they're the largest corporation in the United States today. Okay, so that's the beauty of small business that it creates jobs. It also fuels innovation. Some of you guys in this room are going to start things that are brand new to the marketplace that we need. You're going to innovate something new, and they vitalize inner cities. We've talked in this class about things like 
You and I, we enjoy the parks and the, and the, the different things that corporations dedicate to our city. That's kind of cool. Okay, so there's that. I'll move on. Um, too fast? Yeah. All you gotta know is kind of jobs. My, my main point is that small businesses create jobs and I'll, I'll drive that point home when we watch a quick video about the Small Business Administration, okay? So, um, next two slides. I wanna talk about the profile of you. Who all are you? Who are you? So you are the risk takers who are gonna start a venture, yeah? yeah? Why are you doing it? How many of you in reality, not just for the purpose of my paper, and you're not hurting my feelings if you don't raise your hand because I never wanted to start a small business, but how many of you in reality aren't thinking about starting a small business? Let me see hands. And for the viewers at home, it's the majority of people, almost everybody. Okay, why? Great, fine. I, I like working for myself. Okay, so I heard two times the idea of independence, right? Is that a word up there? Yeah, right. all right, the idea of independence. I wanna work for myself. Who else? Something different. I wanna make a lot of money. Yeah, look, oh my God. Can I say something? There is nothing wrong with owning that. Um, there's so much chatter on the news lately about like vilifying people who are successful and make money. Um, I feel like it is almost our moral obligation to make money, and I hope that you do some good with that money too on the side, you know? But man, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I have some kind of concept that I wanna make a lot of money with it. What's wrong with that? Because then when you make a lot of money, what do you do with some of that money? Hopefully you get back to your community, you, you, know, you do something good. Okay, so guys, I, I applaud you for saying that. Um, that might be, well, there's that. <laughs> okay, cool, what else? And you don't have to just give me the answers on this board, but why are you all starting a business? So uh, the idea of independence and, and also maybe and flexibility. Something that's not already out there. Great, yeah. You have an idea that the marketplace needs, that there's gonna be really awesome demand for. Now, if you don't, or if you have a really hard time verbalizing why the market needs your idea and why it doesn't exist, then you better think twice about investing your money in this. Do you understand that? Because any bank and any investor, that's the first thing they're looking for. Is there gonna be a market need for this thing, okay? So yeah, all of those types of things, all right? Um, the mindset of an entrepreneur. You have a vision. I heard self-reliance, right? Um, you've got the energy, the confidence. But here's one more point I wanna make. The only point I wanna make on this slide. Next week, let me change the subject for one second. Next week, I am going to give you guys a lecture. It's my favorite lecture of the, of the term about personal finance, money, okay? And we're gonna talk about the stock market, nothing to do with business, having to do with personal finance, your pockets, all right? It's my favorite lecture. You're gonna listen to me in this little financial lecture next week, and some of you are gonna say, oh, this doesn't appeal to me at all because it's way too risky. Okay, back to my lecture today. Let me tell you something. The stock market every year over long periods returns back to investors five to six percent. The stock market is way less risky in a lot of situations than starting a small business is. So if you are not comfortable with risk, okay, you better think long and hard about starting a business because your money would actually probably be safer in the stock market. And I'll prove that to you because I'm going to show you the failure rates of small businesses. Do you guys, I, I might have told you already, but when private equity firms invest in companies, startups, they are ready and prepared to fail on 90% of their investments. 90% of the money that they give to startups wind up failing, resulting in bankruptcy. Do you know that? It's crazy to think about. But they take gambles because it's like gambling, right? For every one big, you know, new thing that becomes a Facebook um, or a Donna Karen or one hundred flowers, companies make billions. Okay, so risk. You have to be tolerant of the idea that your money could be lost. All right, talk about me. So remind me one more time. Amy's ice cream. Where'd the money come from? Yeah, twenty-two shareholders, and really. 
in that case, shareholder is just a fancy word for my mama, my friend, the guy I used to work with at Steve's Ice Creams, another company, right? That's really all they were. They weren't like institutional investors. Okay, now, that's this, okay? But before we go there, I wanna talk to you guys about part two, letter E. So if you have your syllabus, take a quick peek at part two, letter E. I want to show you how to write part two letter E. And I want to tell you what not to say in part two letter E. Okay, so if you don't know your syllabus, part two letter E is um, the startup. Okay, it's a startup plan. And basically what the bank or the investor wants to know from you in part two letter E is how much does it cost and where is it coming from? Okay, so the how much does it cost, that's something you're going to figure out in a different section. You're gonna figure that out in part seven. But the where is it coming from? I wanna make that point right now, okay? Do not write in part two letter E. Do not write, this business is looking for 100% of the startup cost. If your startup cost is $10,000, do not ask for $10,000. Why not? As I'm looking at this first bullet. Say that again, because you have to. Yeah, you guys, what bank in their right mind, what investor in their right mind would lend you or give you 100% of your startup cost with you standing to lose absolutely nothing? Who would do that? Maybe your mama would, because she loves you and she knows where you live. But what investor, what bank in their right mind is gonna invest 100%? Think about it. When you go to buy a house, I use this analogy a lot. When you go to buy a house, is the bank ever gonna lend you 100% of the value of the house where you have to put nothing in, nothing down? No, right? That used to be, do you remember the subprime mortgages we talked about? That used to be the case. Man, did they stop that. I realized that was a really bad idea, right? Okay, why? Why is personal resources, your own pocket, important? Why do you need to show, and I'm not saying you have to have like all the money, then what would be the point of applying for a loan or looking for an investor? But why is an investor or a bank looking for you to have some money tied into it? Maybe it's just 10%. Maybe if the business requires $10,000, you have $1,000 that you're putting in. Why? Yeah, if you have skin in the game, and you stand to lose something should this business go awry and that you're gonna take this seriously. Maybe this money is your whole life savings, right? Man, are you gonna take that seriously? Most people put their whole life savings into the house that they buy and they take care of that house because they own a piece of it. You follow? Okay, so back to part two, letter E. All you're doing is writing like two sentences and the first sentence is, the total startup cost of John Conti Sandwich Shop is $10,000. That's a good first sentence. And then the second sentence is, um, the businesses look, the businesses or the owner, whatever, whoever you are, the proprietor, the principal, the founder, uh, is contributing $3,000. And we're looking, the business is looking for $7,000 in loans or investment. That's it, three sentences, I lied. Right? You're basically stating what's the total startup cost, how much are you putting in from personal resources, whatever that is, hopefully it's just money you save, and then how much are you looking for in loans and loans and or investments. Okay? Clear? All right, we just knocked out another section for you guys. Good? Questions? Good? Okay, cool. All right, so that's that. The most important part is proving that money is coming from your pocket. Okay, then we've got loans. Now, I wanna talk in this slide about the difference between loans and this, okay? And I use the word this, private equity. They're not exactly the same, but for the point of this lecture, we're gonna kinda of use them interchangeably, okay? Venture capital, private equity firms, all right? Um, so first of all, any one of you could walk into Chase Bank today and you could get a personal loan, yeah? And as a corporation, you could get a corporation's loan, a loan to your corporation, 
Okay, so what happens after you pay that money back? So you get a loan from a bank. Bank lends you money, either you personally or it lends it to your business if you're a corporation. And what happens after you pay the money back? It's kind of a stupid question. Yeah, that's it. They're out of your ear, you don't talk to them again, okay? Unless like that's where you have your checking and savings account. But once you pay that money back, right? You're done, relationships free. Understood? Okay. Here, they are not lending you money, okay? What they are doing instead is they are sort of purchasing a part of your business. They're investing for usually minority ownership, which means a minority stake, less than 50%, okay? So, on the Chase side, you can walk into Chase Bank and get a loan. On the JP Morgan side of JP Morgan Chase, they are a private equity financial institution. What do they do? They take money on behalf of their investors and they are looking to invest in startups, right? And usually not just any startups, okay? They're not looking to invest in another Mexican restaurant in Dallas, um, unless it's gonna be some kind of new, you know, the promise of a new mega chain that looks Awesome. I had Taco Banner last night, it was so good. Um, but they're looking for the next big thing, okay? Is it kind of like Shark Tank? Sort of, yeah. In fact, so some of those people are just wealthy individuals. They're just literally people that individually are investors. But some of those people actually are bankers within private equity firms, right? They're, they're dealers in private equity firms. So yes, they're looking to invest on behalf of their lots of investors in their private equity firms. You guys, Dallas, Texas is the land of private equity money. I mean that, okay? You guys all been through Highland Park, down Crescent Road, you've seen all those big mansions? Every other mansion is probably there because of private equity money. Do you all know the big house, the really, really big one in the middle of Lakeside Drive? Do you know that pretty park? You just go down Preston, just here. You know the big fountain? Oh, okay. Fountains at Oak Lawn and whatever, Armstrong, right? A couple more blocks down, there's three big mansions, and there's one really big one in the middle. Take a drive later today. You'll, you'll, literally, you'll crash your car, so be careful. <laughs> um, that is the home of John Muse, uh, and it's like a $50 million house. He is private equity. He has a private equity firm in Dallas called HM Capital. It has a new name now, but Hicks Muse. The Muse is him. And um, that's what they do. They invest in startups across lots of different industries. Many of these startups fail. I'll show you in a second. Um, but a few of them become the next big thing. A few of them become eventually these giant corporations. Okay? One last thing, we'll move on. So, first of all, does everybody understand for your business plans, part two, letter E, what are you going to write? Beautiful. What your shortfall is, right? How much don't you have that you're looking for? Either in a loan or some type of investment, okay? By the way, for some of you, the answer may be zero. I don't need any outside money. I've got it all. That's okay. That's fine. You're not looking for a loan. It doesn't still mean that you don't need an investor to help you grow. It just means that you have all the money to cover your startup costs. That's good for you, okay? Look. Amy probably had all the money she needed for one store, but not nine, right? She didn't realize maybe up front that it was gonna be that successful that she could stand to open eight more. Wait, so like, if we're taking loans, can we do it from our family? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and the family members can become shareholders in your corporation, absolutely. So instead of making mom, we love her dearly, uh, a partner, okay? That that mom's gonna die and who knows what's gonna happen later. Not to be morbid, but you need to be realistic here, yeah? You'd be better off making mom a shareholder in the corporation. She invests, she owns shares in your corporation, and hopefully what we can do for mom is make her investment grow. Cool? Okay, so talking about the difference between loans and venture. So you guys tell me, once we pay the loan back, thanks out of our hair, our relationship's done. What happens with our relationship with the venture capital company, the private equity firm? So they invest, they're investing for part ownership of the company. What do they want? 
What do they want from our lives? Okay. Sure. Yes. Eventually, you want to see return on investment, right? So they have made an investment. They want to see the value of their investment grow and maybe dividends. Sure. They keep investing money. They may. Yup. Um, a great example was Donna Karen. I like to talk about her. I read a whole book about how really Donna Karen wouldn't have been Donna Karen if it weren't for private equity firms. Okay? And yeah, you know how she began to open stores all over the world through constant reinvestment of private equity? Sure. What's their ultimate goal? What do you guys think? What is their ultimate goal? What are they trying to do? Obviously not fail and obviously make money. What's their ultimate goal? Not really. Actually, kind of the opposite, believe it or not. What? Yeah, <clears throat> agreed. What do you guys think? What do you think company comes in and buys a minority stake in your company? What do you think they want? They want it to be big or grow. Agree? We'll not argue there. They want it to grow in whatever ways it can grow. More inventory, more stores, more short. Sure. Think back to last week, the last slide of last week we talked about Ways companies grow. Do they want to what? see it? No, so, uh, like so let me say that. Do so they have a percentage already, right? And usually it's a minority stake, whatever that is. Um, maybe for the short term they may grow their percentage, sure. Um, or the percentage that they have, the stake that they have in the organization, it, has grow it grows in value over time, ideally. What's the ultimate? And this happens rarely. Okay, you're thinking back to the idea of merger and acquisition. It's another word. They want to sell it. They want to spin off. And the only left, last word left on that slide was divestiture. <laughs> so we got all four words: merger, acquisition, divestiture, spin off. Um, here's what they want to do. I'm going to tell you. They ultimately want to get these companies to uh, an IPO. What does that mean? IPO. And that's exactly the story of Facebook and Instagram and I mean, uh, Snapchat. They want to get these companies to launch an IPO. Who remembers? Nobody. Initial public offering. What is an initial public offering? Remember, these are small private companies. They're startups, they're babies, but they've grown. Go and then, say it, go public. go public, right. Initial public offering is the first time that a private business sells shares of stock on its public stock exchange. And what do you think the venture capital company does at that point? Buys no stock. Nope, the opposite. Peace is out. Peace, right? They exit. So basically they sell their shares to the public and then usually they leave with billions of dollars. Okay. That's a best case scenario. For every one of those stories, there's 90 stories of failure, small business failure. Okay? That's the goal usually of these private equity companies is to get these small startups to become large enough to actually go public and then they cash out, they bow out. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of written questions on exam number two. Here's one of them. Um, it's kind of a really like open-ended question, but I'm gonna tell you guys, um, I'm not looking for bullshit answers on this question, okay? So I'm gonna tell you what I'm not looking for. The question is, why do companies fail? Okay, so man, you can bullshit anything, man. You know, a company fails because it's the wrong location. I'm sorry, but Location nowadays should have nothing to do with why businesses succeed or fail. Man, if you don't have a website, and if you are not focusing on your online presence, I don't care, you could be based in some kind of subterranean sewer, okay? And if your product is good and you're marketing that product effectively online, your location should have nothing to do with, with failure. It may have something to do with success, sure, but it should have nothing to do with failure. So location is a lame answer. Okay, that's a lazy business person who's blaming location on their failure. Why do businesses fail? I'm gonna tell you the number one answer. What? 
Sure, okay, just literally somebody who is so green and does has not had the experience of operating the business that they're making continually bad decisions. Sure, can't argue that, right? But I'm gonna tell you the number one reason why businesses fail, and then I'll show you the failure rate on the next slide. Cash flow. There's your answer. That would be a good answer to this question. Let me explain to you what cash flow is. Um, the best way I can explain this is interior design businesses. Anybody interior design in the room? Cool. Where were you yesterday on my fun field trip to uh, Duncan Miller Ullman? They were awesome, by the way. Commercial interior design company. Super cool. They gave us a good tour. And they took us through a bunch of projects that they're working on right now that um, are these super high-end hotels. Really, really cool. Anyway, um, not to throw shade at you, but um, cash flow. So think about it. Okay, an interior design firm, yeah? They do a whole bunch of design work for clients, right? They may take a deposit from a client up front, but as they're working on the work, when are they collecting the money? Yeah, a lot of it is coming at the end when the project is done, okay? Think about the cash flow implications of that, right? You have to own and operate a business during all of these months where you're working, you've got work. It's not like a retail store where the minute you sell something, you put the money in the cash register, right? It's, you have to manage a business and pay employees and pay your marketing and pay your rent, and you're not collecting at least a portion of it until the end. That's cash flow. So let me give you a suggestion. Part seven, letter A. Take a look. Part seven, letter A of the business plan is capital, equipment, and expenses. See it? Mm. Part seven, letter A. Yeah, the last section, letter A. Okay, capital equipment expenses. So just as a reminder, that's the section where you're gonna like make a list of all the stuff that you need to get the business started, right? Your equipment, your fixtures, your decor, blah, blah, blah. Labor, construction. Okay, let's think about this for a second. You know what would be a really good idea to add for yourselves in part seven, letter A? Money. Mr. Conti, what do you mean, mean money? Isn't all of this money? No, I literally mean cash. What if you started the business and in part seven letter A, in addition to like couch, sofa, furniture, desk, computer, laptop, you also had cash supply or cash reserve or whatever the hell you want to call it, cash flow. And you earmarked, whatever it is, a little bit of money to help your business operate in the early months because you, you have to pay your marketing and your rent and your employees. What if you earmarked a little bit of cash for yourselves, right? As a startup cost. Yeah, because what did I just tell you? Most businesses go out of business because they have massive cash flow problems. So what if you earmarked a little bit of cash for yourself to start the business up with? That would be really good sound practice, okay? And that isn't cheating, it's not shady business, it's not me padding the budget in case I make a mistake. That's literally cold hard cash that you wanna just hold on to in case of, you know, in case of. Cool? Okay, boom. That's all I wanted to talk about here. Why businesses fail. And the number one issue businesses come across is cash flow, right? Your accounts receivables take time to receive. Okay, and your accounts payables, man, they're always due, right? The bills are always due, but money comes in. Okay, one quick thing I wanna say about this. The failure rate of small businesses, take a look between years five and six. Between years five and six, half of all businesses fail. By year six, 60% 60 of all businesses fail, majority. So between years five and six, the majority of all small businesses fail. Why am I so doomsday right now? It's my job to warn you. For those of you who sit through my lecture next week about the stock market and you think to yourselves, too risky, doesn't appeal to me, right? Doing this is even more risky, okay? Investing your money in your small business, oftentimes you have to have a level of risk tolerance. And that risk is greater often than investing in the stock market, taking that same amount of money and just passively investing in the stock market. Okay. 
SBA. So I've thrown around those letters a lot in class. We talked about the SBA. I wanted to show you a little, this is kind of a, it's gonna, it's a little bit salesy in this video, but it gives you a good sense of what the SBA does. You guys, when you walk into a bank and you apply for a loan, especially a loan as a corporation, that loan is underwritten, it's subsidized by the SBA. Okay, so let's, let's think back to the beginning of the class. Do you guys remember we talked about the bailout in like chapter two? Do you remember the bailout, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, and the American mm -hmm. Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act? Do you remember those two? Yeah, the bailout? So I know I said lots of bad things about the bailout, but honestly, one really good thing about the bailout was that the federal government pumped money, a lot of money, into the SBA. Remember, the SBA is an agency of the federal government. And what does the SBA do? It basically encourages people to start businesses, okay? By subsidizing loans and by also doing training, a lot like the training that we're doing in this class. Why? Why is the SBA so into people starting businesses? To put money back into the economy. Right, exactly. Because small businesses employ people and then employed people spend money, right? Hopefully it's small businesses. Okay, uh, let me show you just two, two minute quick like little, uh, Pro promo video, but I think it's still informative about North, the SBA. The U.S. Small Business Administration, or SBA, is dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and small business owners start, grow, and succeed in their business ventures. In fact, some of the most recognizable brands started small. For people throughout the United States, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Guam, SBA is here to help at any stage of your business. From writing a business plan to providing resources to export your products overseas. Headquartered in Washington, D.C., SBA has district offices across the country. These offices help entrepreneurs with the three C's, contracting, counseling, and capital. Government contracting can be a critical tool for growing your small business. The government has many categories of contract opportunities set aside exclusively for small businesses. These help level the playing field for women, veterans, and the socially and economically disadvantaged. SBA also offers participation in matchmaking events and the Mentor Protege Program to help small businesses compete more successfully for federal government contracts. Through our district offices and extensive network of resource partners, SBA offers hands-on training, mentoring, and expert advice tailored to your needs. Our online learning center is also available around the clock, so you can explore and take training courses at your convenience. Many entrepreneurs need financial resources to start or expand a small business, and they must combine what they have with other sources of financing. While the SBA doesn't loan money directly to small business owners, we can help facilitate a loan with a third-party lender such as a bank or credit union by guaranteeing that a certain portion of the loan will be repaid. SBA guaranteed loans can be used for various business needs including replenishing seasonal inventory, building expansion or renovation, purchasing equipment, and working capital. Ready to start or grow your small business? Visit sba.gov to learn more about how we can help. All right, second question, written question on exam number two. What was the first question? Uh, why, do why do businesses fail? Yeah, so my second question, I'm gonna give you a little scenario. Oh God, Mr. Conti, here goes that weird Nokia question. Um, I'm gonna give you a little scenario. Don't even worry about what the scenario is, but I'm gonna ask you, do you think it makes more sense for a company to start from scratch or for a would-be business owner to buy an existing business? And I wanna start there by talking about buying an existing business, okay? Because a lot of you, I bet, think that when you hear about or see a business being sold, small business, right, a proprietor selling off their business, that something's wrong with it. Yes? Well, what's wrong with it? Maybe it's failing. Okay, well, let's think back though, because last week 
we were talking about LVMH, right? Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, right? And I told you every year Louis Vuitton sells one of its companies, right? It divests, remember that word divest, divests is to sell. But when? When does a company like LVMH divest one of its companies? When it's failing? Right, when it has pumped more money into it and it has grown the value of the business and the business is more viable, right? And then it sells off the business. And by the way, why would a company like LVMH sell one of its businesses? Yeah, to grow, right? To grow. Okay, so the same is true here. It's the same, it's the same mindset. Why do you think a business owner is selling off his or her business? Okay, so before I go there, it could be something like mom and pop have died and the kids are inheriting and they want nothing to do with what mom and pop's business was. So they're just liquidating because they want to make money. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Mom and pop are retiring. Now they're too old, they've done their thing, they're selling it off. But most times a small business is for sale because the business is valuable. And now the proprietor is selling off to make their profit and to move on, okay, to whatever it is. So what's good about that? What is good about buying an existing business? What are the pros? The brand name. The Great. Name. Yeah. It's already successful. Even sure. Client, you know? Yeah. So the company has an established reputation in the marketplace. People know of it. It has an established customer base. Um, you know what you can do to an existing business before you buy it? Just like you can do this to a house or a car before you buy it, you can kick the tires. You know what I mean by that? I mean, you can expect its, inspect its financials. You can look at last year's tax returns. You can look at its accounting records to see. There's a track record. That's kind of cool, right? You know what you're getting into. There's a lot less mystery as to, am I gonna fail or succeed? What else? What's good about this? What do you inherit when you buy a small business that exists already and has been operating? What do you inherit? Stuff, like the brick and mortar stuff. Great. Buying a used car, you guys know this, is a much better value than buying a new car. Yes or no? Yeah. You knew that? Yeah. Because when you buy a used car and you drive it off the lot, it doesn't depreciate quite as much as when you buy a brand new car and you drive it off the lot. It, you take a, a depreciation hit. Same thing with a small business. You buy a small business, you know what you're inheriting? You're inheriting all the fixtures and the equipment and the hard stuff in the inventory at a discount, right? At a less aggressive depreciation rate. Fancy way of saying it, a discount. Okay, so that's good. I also heard customers. Yeah, there's an established customer base. Now that might be a drawback too, we'll talk about that. But um, inherit, you inherit customers. You know what else you inherit? Employees who already know how to do things. Okay, so that's the pros. What are the cons? I tell you one con you might not know about, hidden debt. Oh, yeah. what happens if you buy the business and then all of a sudden suppliers come out of the woodworks, knock, knock. I'll knock in case any of you are asleep. <laughs> knock, knock. Uh, you have invoices that are, you know, years past due. So there could be hidden debt. How about things like disgruntled employees, disgruntled customers? How about customers who hate change? Yeah. You may be one of those. I don't know. I'm not that old and I hate change. I go into my favorite restaurant. I'll tell you, my favorite, one of my favorite restaurants at North Park. I get the same dish every time. I eat there like once a week. And um, they changed it slightly. Okay. This is so lame. I'm like complaining to you all about it. But I know because I eat that damn thing every week. And they changed it slightly and I'm annoyed about it. <laughs> I'm a little annoyed about it. Right? Are you calling me an old person? <laughs> <laughs> older people. Older. How many of you guys though? You don't like when something that you're accustomed to is different. Um, I'll tell you right now what you don't like when prices go up. Yeah? A lot of times a small business, the minute they hang up under new management, even if the place had its issues, we start to look for, well, what's gonna be different? Price is going up? Is product gonna be different? Is service gonna be different? What's gonna be different? Right? Um, back to my dry cleaner. When my dry cleaner changed owners, this is so stupid. 
but they changed the hangers from black to white. And it kind of annoyed me because then half my closet was like these white hangers, they were old and then the new ones were black. No, the new ones were white. It was annoying. Yeah. So customers are really fickle and they dislike change. And new management equals change. You know what it also equals? Your inability to be creative and to do new things. Do you get that? Okay, what else? Drawbacks. Disgruntled employees, disgruntled consumers, hidden debt, suppliers that come out of the woodwork, resistance to change. Anything else you can think of? And then now you're responsible. Okay, that'll be true also in a starting from scratch, like you are responsible. But how about things like um, damaged reputation? Oh yeah. What if you don't do your homework and you don't fully understand how damaged the reputation of an existing business is? Because maybe mom and pop in their last year or so, it kind of grew disinterested. Okay, starting from scratch. So raise your hand, let me just ask you, if you are, I think the majority, are starting your business from scratch. In your business plan, you are not planning on buying an existing business. Let me see hands, almost everybody. For those of you not raising your hands, what are you buying? Or you're just not paying attention. Okay, that's cool, that's cool too. Okay, so starting from scratch, um, what are the pros? Oh, you just do it your way, be creative. Great. Your brand, your customers, your training, your employees, your vision, your product, your prices, great. So it's you, okay? Um, I'll also tell you that's a huge drawback because all of that requires a lot of risk. It's very tough to get a consumer to spend their money with you instead of somewhere else, instead of wherever it is that they're spending now. Very tough to get them to change. What else are pros? Maybe you Great, okay. All the baggage we just talked about is not there, right? So there's no hidden debt, there are no hidden disgruntled suppliers, employees, customers, there's no damage reputation. All that baggage, not there. What else, pros? Introducing something new to the market. Yeah, I don't know if that's a pro or a con, to be honest with you. To me, it's that's almost a hurdle you have to get over. Mm -hmm. People are not always that excited about a new concept unless you do a really good job marketing the value that you are about to deliver for that customer. What are the pros? And if you put it in the right location. I feel like some city, or development stuff, like I feel like it's start from work, what would it be people like? Agree with that. To try to do sure. This. Depending on what you are. Like, Deep Ellum probably does not need another, you know, dive bar. Yeah, that's you know? Bar. But, uh, you know, what Deep Ellum does need now are more daytime businesses because people are going there in the day, right? It's not just like a CD nighttime activity anymore. Like, there's a candle making workshop. There are really cool coffee shops. Like, there are great spa, uh, 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 hair salons. Yeah, all that stuff. Food, daytime food, right. So, sure, yeah, depending on what you are. I agree with all those. Okay, drawbacks. So, the biggest drawback, failure rate. What did I tell you? Between year five and six, what happens? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. What else? How about paying a premium for everything? Write that down. Everything is a premium, yes? You start from scratch, you are buying new equipment, new supplies, new everything, you are paying a premium for things. What else? Customers that don't have customers, right? You're not inheriting customers. Your main focus is to try to market to and convince customers to spend their money with you. That's your biggest challenge, okay? All right, cool. What was the question? Written question on exam number two, what's the question? It makes more sense to, to start from scratch or buy Yes. Yeah. So honestly, forget about whatever scenario I give you, who cares? You should just be ready to argue in favor or against one or the other. Do you believe that starting from scratch is more advantageous? Do you believe that maybe buying an existing business is more advantageous? It's up to you, okay? Just be able to identify some pros and cons. Okay, cool. 
Um, what is next? Charles decided to take a short holiday. Um, yeah, so I want to spend really the rest of our meeting today just talking one more time about the business plan. But before we do that, um, as I promised, I wanted to present to you guys this company, Rent the Runway. So one more time, how many of you have heard of Rent the Runway? Let me see hands. Only like, oh my God, three people. Cool, okay. So I honestly, you guys, well, I wanna say two things. One is, man, this is one of those businesses that I said to myself, why wasn't that my idea, right? <laughs> that was something that was so obviously missing in the marketplace. And if you think about it, like men have been able to rent things like a tux for a hundred years, but women really never had that option. And it's a brilliant concept, and now all of a sudden, every retailer is jumping on the bandwagon. Um, I saw Banana Republic and Bloomingdale's, they just announced that they're doing rental programs. You're gonna start to see everybody adapting like an Uber or an Airbnb model. So I wanted to just show you this um, couple minutes, it's a CBS video about, about this company, and let me just set up why I'm showing it to you. Two words, you can find them in part one, letter B. Part one, letter B, and I think this video pretty much sums up a great example of competitive advantage, okay? A company that does something that is completely different, better, unique, from what the competitors are doing. Here we go. Two women from Harvard Business School dreamed up a company based on a simple premise. A woman never has to wear the same outfit twice and she doesn't have to buy it at all. Sounds good, right? Millions of other women like that idea too. Michelle Miller's inside a warehouse in Secaucus, New Jersey, just west of New York City, with a story that you'll see only on CBS this morning. Michelle, we like it. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this is just about every woman's fantasy. Thousands and thousands of dresses right at her fingertips. Well, Rent the Runway was to change the way a woman gets dressed and how she invests in a wardrobe. So the woman who says to you, I have nothing to wear, you're turning her on her head. Well, we have 100,000 options of what she can wear. Inside this 40,000 square foot warehouse in Secaucus, New Jersey, is the giant closet that is Rent the Runway. The company, part e-commerce site and part tech startup, stores some pretty glamorous merchandise. 100,000 designer dresses all available for rental through their website. Before we send out any dress or any piece of jewelry to a customer, we'll do a final check to make sure that it's in perfect condition. With more than 250 designer brands, rental prices range from $5 to $475. This $3,500 Calvin Klein dress rents for $170. This $1,000 Oscar de la Renta necklace for just 150. Jennifer Hyman is Rent the Runway's CEO. Who is Rent the Runway's target customer? I call her the go-getter girl. She's a professional and she's using Rent the Runway because it helps her optimize her time. Do these designers to you as their competition? Designers see us as one of their biggest allies because we're introducing a demographic of women that was not entering department stores to their brands. They come to me, they start renting $2,000 dresses, and they develop that brand affinity early. So you hook them? I hook them. I'm like a drug dealer. <laughs> Can't get enough. Drug dealer of fashion. Do you think that the size is right? Kayla Gogos has been renting for weddings, parties, and dates going on three years. She now tries on possible rentals at the company's first standalone store in New York City. In a day where we don't always splurge, it feels like a very like, inexpensive luxury. With thousands of styles to choose from, customers can browse by trend or event, borrowing items for up to eight nights. Rent the Runway sends two sizes to ensure the proper fit. After the rental ends, the outfit is shipped back for free. Hyman says this has been Rent the Runway's secret weapon. Welcome to the country's largest dry cleaning facility. A warehouse and technology system that organizes and dispatches more than 90,000 items every day to its 5 million members across the country. 
An average dress on Rent the Runway goes home to 30 different customers. You get 30 turns out of every dress. How is that possible? It is possible when you own the dry cleaning process. So we now know what kinds of lace should be put on a dress, what kinds of sequins designers should use. But it wasn't that way when the company launched in 2009. We actually had our warehouse within a dry cleaner, and every day we would get there at 4 in the afternoon and pick, pack, and ship the orders ourselves. Rent the Runway's internal research shows that the average woman buys 64 new pieces of clothing every year. But will rental therapy replace retail therapy? Women love to share when they look great. Women love to share when they feel self-confident. And it helps us that an icebreaker amongst women is, oh my God, I love your outfit, you look amazing. And women feel comfortable saying now, you know, I rented the runway. And this company is continuing to expand. They plan to move into a new warehouse four times this size later this fall. And ladies, I have a little surprise for you. Uh, we'll skip their horrible jokes that are really annoying. But, um, <laughs> so competitive advantage, right? Like this is a concept that A, it didn't exist. So that's the best kind of competitive advantage is when like literally there is competition. It's just that you're doing something that is a service that doesn't exist. Now you guys, I'm not telling you, you need to come up with something that literally does not exist, okay? That's not the only way, that's not the only key to a successful business. But what I am telling you is your concept has really got to answer the question, how are you different, better, unique, okay? If you are not different, better, or unique, man, your business plan is gonna go in the garbage. I will read the whole thing, I promise you, but no bank and no lender and no investor is going to invest in a company that is not bringing to the marketplace something that is, um, you know, not another Mexican restaurant in Dallas. You with me on this one? Okay, so let's go over one more time. I know we've done this a few times already, um, but maybe you were not ready to really dig in, and now, you know, ready or not, <laughs> here December 19th comes, right? Um, let's talk about, let's talk about your questions mostly, okay? So let me start by asking you this, and be honest, how many of you have started? And by started, I mean beyond the toilet bowl homework of just thinking about this. Let me, how many of you start? Okay, slightly frightening, but okay. <laughs> slightly concerning, but you know, more power to you. Um, and I know because I've read, I've already read some of your drafts, so that's awesome. You guys, um, I will be available all of December, so um, you can bring to me your drafts. You know, I would love to give you feedback. I'll read them. I'll give you suggestions. What I don't want to do after today, though, is I please don't ask me to explain something to you from scratch, okay? Because after today, I will have given you all of that information three, four, four times. All right. So when you come meet with me, you're going to show me, you know, what you've accomplished, and I will give you direction and feedback. Okay, so um, cover page, you guys already know, name, your name, company name, the logo, the date, and I need the word business plan, and that might sound like, okay, how anal, you know, why so specific, because this is not the only document that you are going to be submitting to a bank or an investor. Do you understand that? You're gonna be submitting things like financial records and your personal tax returns and other shit that I don't wanna look at, it's none of my business, but that you would be showing an investor for a bank, okay? So I need to know that this document is the business plan. That's why I'm asking you to write that down. Okay, part one we've talked about a ton. Please just make sure, first of all, a reminder that you're writing in third person. Does everybody understand what third person is? Have you met John Conti? John Conti is the executive vice president of Wade College. John Conti has been teaching for, talk about yourself, talk about the business. Do not write I, me, my, we, our, and do not write you. Because when you say you, we're gonna cut your hair. The bank doesn't need a haircut. The investor is not interested in getting a haircut, all right? So write about the business. You can use the business's name. You can, you can, when you talk about you, you can use your name or you can also say the proprietor, the founder, the principal, the owner, whoever you are. Write about yourself like you're having an out-of-body experience, okay? And when you write about the customer, say the customer. Don't say you, say the customer. The customer, the client. Okay, um, 
In, in part 1A, and I won't spend a million years in each section, but please make sure you're writing like the reader has no idea what the business is. Do you understand that? You need to really explain it. If you're a retail business, say that. If you're a wholesale business, say that. If you're an online business, say it. If you're home base, say it, okay? And then the other really important thing is the city and state. Give the investor or the bank the chance right up front to say, yes, I want to invest in this city or no, I don't. Maybe they have enough exposure to Miami, Florida. They don't want another business in Miami, Florida. Tell them where you're based. Cool? Okay, stop me with questions. All questions are good questions now, all right? Including, I really don't understand this section. That's, that's a good question today, all right? And then competitive advantage. Um, let me tell you what generally loses points here. Want to know that? Okay. So if your whole competitive advantage is just that you have, we have great customer service. Every business claims they have great customer service. What's different about the customer service that your company offers? What is a service that other competitors don't offer that you offer? That's a good competitive advantage, okay? So you gotta really think about what doesn't exist that our company does. So when you're explaining how it's different, mm -hmm. do you include what you do? Because it's hard to explain how you're competitive. Sure, you explain yeah, what you're doing. absolutely. Um, my retail boutique sells both, you know, women's designer apparel and cupcakes and baked items. Okay. And the business is the only business in a five mile radius that combines these two unique types of products. Sure, and so what's the point? The point is, we are the only one that does that in our vicinity, okay? Sure, sure. Okay, other questions about part one? Part two is the devil's in the details. I always say that. Um, what you don't wanna write in part two is to be determined. Don't write that, okay? I will literally write, determine it, all right? Part two, you wanna make sure that you're being clear exactly that you pulled the trigger, that you understand the plan, all right? Part A is what you sell. Part B is where your location is and why. The why is important. Now, you say where. Well, Mr. Conti, I already told you in part one, it's Dallas, Texas. Now you're gonna give me the address, right? Make it clear to the investor that you know that a location's been chosen, okay? And then why? Why North Park Center 8950? You know, is it because of foot traffic? Is it because of um, the population? Is it because the target audience is close in the vicinity? Is it because of adjacency to another business? Um, when I worked for Alfred Angelo Bridal, we always built our stores next to Starbucks. That's always where we wanted to be. Why? Yeah, because Starbucks has very regular traffic. Customers of Starbucks go to Starbucks on a daily or weekly basis. And it's tough as a bridal brand to do marketing that sticks in your mind for a really long time. But when you go to a business a lot, and you see the neighboring businesses in three years from now, when all of a sudden, oh my God, I got engaged and I'm ready to look for a dress, what comes into your mind? Well, the places that you're used to seeing a lot. So sometimes like that very repetitive foot traffic is marketing itself. So that was our philosophy. Okay, so that's the location, where and why, hours of operation. Ownership, you guys were not ready to write about this last week, now you are, right? You can say that the, your company is going to be an S corporation. Tell me who the owners are. Don't just assume I know it's just you. Is your mother a, 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 a vet, part owner investor? Um, are you bringing on another person Maybe more. Maybe you have 22 family member and friend investors. And then we talked about E already a lot today, okay? Make sure 100% cannot come from the investor or the bank, right? Okay. E, the last part of part, oh, F rather, last part. This is a list of all of the things that you need to get done, with the very last thing being grand opening. So what are the things that you need to get done? Start with completing the business plan. Then what else? Get a loan. Get a loan. How much buyer 
marketing, promotions, website, buying inventory, hiring employees, training employees, budget, budget sure, managing budgets. What else you got? Doing the marketing, sure. Designing it and then actually paying for it, placing it. What else you got? Uh, buying supplies, buying inventory, doing construction, getting the labor done, um, you know, the decor, installing displays. If you're a physical retail thing. You want to be like super in depth? Um, up to you. You know. Can you just be vague about it? A little bit, sure. Um, if there are really glaring things missing, I'm gonna call you out on it. Like, okay. if you've talked about employees in part six, and then you've never told me like, when are you gonna hire employees, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out on that, okay? So just make sure you're addressing like the big, the big obvious stuff, okay? Can you talk yes. about the prices there, like how much everything costs, like um, buying stuff? You, no, you don't need to discuss that here. This is more, if you wanna make that an item like, determine prices, that would be good, sure. sure. So this is just a laundry list of things to do with the very last thing being grand opening. Cool? All right, good questions. Part three, product overview. How many of you are not selling a product at all? How many of you are doing like a service-based business? In my evening class, it was the majority of students, probably because a lot of them are interior design. So for you guys, you're gonna change the name of this to service overview because you don't sell a product, right? You only sell a service. For the rest of you, product overview is what you're gonna call it. Part A is a really in-depth menu of exactly what do you sell. Now you might say, Mr. Conti, I already told you in part one what I sell, and I've already told you in part two what I sell. Now I want the deep dive. If you've already told me this is women's designer goods, now I wanna know that it's outerwear swimwear, it's evening wear, it's knit shirts, woven shirts, sweaters. Now I want the literally the categories of merchandise, okay? Give me the menu. If this is a spa, this is where you're going into your spa menu of the specific services and what they retail for. Cool? And then part B, where does it come from? Where does it come from? Um, how many of you guys are selling a product that is already made that you are purchasing from wholesale hands and how okay so for you guys you're going to name for me where's it coming from who are the wholesale vendors that you're getting your goods from do not name retail companies clear about that i don't want to see costco's and walmart's and businesses don't buy from retail companies they buy from wholesale relate you know relationships how many of you are making a product yourselves whether you're getting it Manufactured or whatever the case. Okay, so for you guys, this section is going to be where do your goods come from, your raw materials? Fashion designers, where do you buy your fabric and your trimming and your buttons and your zippers and your interfacing and your lining? And so, is that what if you're not buying from a wholesale problem? Like, where are you buying from? I mean, sometimes it's like Joanne's and Ralph's and things like that. It's not a really good way to be a profitable business. Right. So, I would encourage you not to. Okay? If you're buying fabric from Joann's, you really should be buying your fabric from a wholesale resource. Mm -hmm. Because how can you ever make a profit if you're paying retail to begin right. with? What consumer is gonna pay a markup on top of retail? Right. So, so you can just put like a website for like, if you're sure. buying fabric yeah. wholesale. Yeah, you guys can so easily go on the Dallas Market Center's website and find out by category every single freaking wholesaler in the building and get yourself a nice little list of who sells the things that you need. It, it is so easy, okay? Good questions. All right, questions about part three. What do you sell? Where does it come from? Cool, all right, good. I see juices flowing. Part four, target market. Please make sure in letter A you answer all of the things I'm looking for, okay? Don't just tell me my target audience is, you know, girls between 18 and 30. Which ones? <laughs> Rich ones or poor ones, black ones or white ones, uh, urban ones or suburban ones, um, white collar ones or blue collar ones, um, you know, active ones or inactive ones. I'm looking for what's their lifestyle, what kind of work do they do, what's their social class, are they upper class, are they middle class, um, what's their income bracket. Somebody who makes $30,000 a year wears different clothes 
drives a different car, eats in a different restaurant than somebody who makes $100,000 a year. Their lifestyles are really different and you need to understand who is it that you're trying to attract. Um, so it would be like whenever she was like, we're in the video she talked about yeah. that girl. Yeah, she's my go-getter girl. Yeah. She's, what she was alluding to is that that is a young working professional, right? Is that what we're doing though? We're kind yes. of thinking of that? Yes. Uh, that audience also, the Rent the Runway Girl probably does not make $120,000 a year or $200,000 a year because that, that customer probably is buying the goods, right? Where this customer is renting the goods. Questions? So since mine is like custom, like formal wear, Really poor people do not get custom clothes made, okay? Really, really wealthy customers go directly to high-end designers in their showrooms in Paris and New York. So I would imagine that your audience is somewhere in between that, okay? So there, I'm narrowing it down for you already. Your income bracket could be broad. Your age bracket could be broad. You're probably not designing for 90-year-old women who don't have a real need for custom-designed clothing. You're probably not designing for a 14 year old girl, right? Maybe the first time somebody gets a custom made garment is Sweet 16 or Prom, maybe, if they have the disposable income to do it. So you gotta be able to narrow it down. So is going to New York considered a work of wholesale? Um, no. You know, they technically they're a retailer because anyone, any one of you could walk in there and buy one yard of fabric. But I do think that if you were to purchase, you know, bulk, that they would work with you as a business. So Sylvia is the owner, and you can talk to her and ask her. You can call her on the phone. Good question. Anybody else? Fine. Really good question. All of you got it. Okay, and then part B is who's your competition? Let me tell you the wrong thing to write here. No competition. <laughs> Every single one of you is asking a consumer to not spend money somewhere. Where is it that you're asking them not to spend their money and to spend it with you instead? Okay, nationally, locally. Good, tell me about a few businesses for both. Yeah, we, that's where we can name businesses. Please, you must name, yeah. Don't just say something like, you know, I compete against other custom dressmakers. Well, zero, you've done no research. You don't know who your competitor is. Um, for you, Andrew, you may wanna look up um, uh, Brooks. They're right across the street in the design district. And um, the owner of Brooks is a Wade graduate from 1980 something. He's huge. Okay, he does lots of custom formal wear. Brooks, I wish I could think of the whole name of it, but I will. Okay, good. Questions? Part five, we're almost done because we're not going to talk about part six. Part five, part five A is like my favorite part. It's the most fun part. And this is the part where I need you guys to be really creative. What are all the different ways you are gonna introduce your business to the marketplace? Marketer, um, tell me about the website that you're gonna have. Tell me about the social media that you're gonna pay for. Tell me about the other types of advertising you're gonna do, even if it's low tech. It could be as simple as doing a postcard mailing to a zip code. You can easily buy addresses from the US Post Office. You might blitz your neighborhood or the area that you're doing business in with flyers. I don't care, it doesn't need to be super fancy, but what are all the different ways that you are going to do your marketing? So, uh, grand opening event. A grand opening event's a great idea, but if nobody's ever heard of you, nobody's coming. How will you market your grand opening event? Okay? If you added a special service to your website, would you put it there or would you just put the website? Um, if the service, what does the service do? Like, say for instance, you can customize something online. I, I would put that as part of um, part three, A. Mm -hmm. I would describe exactly what you sell and then the services that you offer. I'd put that there. Okay. Because it's not necessarily marketing, it's mm -hmm. more about the product and the service that you sell. I'd put that there. Yeah, good question. All right, anybody else so far? Okay, part 5B, I'm going to do this for you guys one more time on the board because it's kind of a little bit of a pain in the ass, but part 5B is really the moment of truth for you all. This is the part where you realize whether or not this is a waste of time or not, right? It's am I going to make money doing this or not? So, part 5B, I know we've done this before, but just as a 
memory refresher. Start with an average transaction. What is one average transaction at your company? So a John Conti sandwich shop, soda and a drink is six bucks. At John Conti's interior design firm, a project might be $10,000. So it's gonna be really, really different based on who you are. If you're a retail store and you're like, Mr. Conti, I have $5 items and I have $300 items. Think about what an average customer purchases. Maybe it's two items and it's somewhere in the middle, okay? It's up, up to you to figure out. Great. If your company has daily transactions, meaning customers come in daily and buy stuff, then do daily transactions. 50, okay? I'm counting on 50 customers making a purchase on an average day. Maybe that's too aggressive. At an interior design firm, there's no daily transactions. We might have one client a month, okay? So make this work for you. Daily sales goal. Again, if you don't have daily sales, you don't have a daily sales goal. $5,000. So we're gonna do some big numbers here, okay? Then you could do weekly sales goal. If you're open seven days a week, multiply by seven. If you're not open seven days a week, don't multiply by seven, you can't have sales on the day you're closed, okay? So seven times five is 35,000, okay? Monthly, the best way to do monthly is to go back to your daily and multiply by 30 because most months have 30 days, okay? Five times three, 15, is that right? No, 1 million, 500,000. I'm just making up numbers, okay? Um, for some of you, you might want to just start here. You might just have a monthly sales goal because it's based on monthly transactions. You might have only one or two clients a month. If you're a fashion show producer, you're not going to produce one show a day. You're going to have maybe a client a month. Okay? So anyway, the whole point of this is to come up with an annual sales goal. Okay? So I might go here and multiply by 12 because it's 12 months in a year. Um, if you're a florist, I might have mentioned this to you already. Probably not a good idea to just make every month the same, right? Because months like February and May are gonna have a lot more business than a month like August where people don't buy flowers, okay? No offense to your August purchases. So you may wanna break this out by month to have a better forecast. At the end of the day, I just want you to be conservative. Don't give me crazy numbers that are gonna set your business up to fail. Be conservative, okay? To have 50 transactions a day, you have to have a lot of foot traffic. Okay, this, this is like a North Park Center to have that kind of transactions day. Okay, so whatever, let's make this a million dollars. No, 12 million dollars. Okay, clearly not very good. All right, that's part 5B. We're gonna need that number later. Cool? All right, questions? So should you also think of it like as retail, like, oh, back to school, like, more people might close in? Definitely. If you wanted to do the monthly thing for 12 months and sh show different numbers, that would be, that'd be ideal. That would be awesome. Okay? Or, or not. Maybe you just do, like, these are three, my three slow months, these are my three really crazy months, and these are my other six average months. Okay. You do that with you. Just as long as you're totaling a whole year's worth of sales business revenue. All right, part six, don't want you to do it just yet, okay? Don't do part six yet, we're not ready, we haven't had a lecture on it. So leave that for the end, all right? Part seven, last section of the paper. Okay, we already talked about A. Make a list of all, part seven A, of the things that you need to buy in order to get your business started. These are the one time upfront expenses. And what was the other thing we talked about adding to the section today? Beautiful. Yeah, that's another way of saying it, petty cash. Sure, petty cash, cash reserve, cash, whatever the hell you want to call it, okay? Piggy bank money, whatever, just a little bit of padding. What is it for? Yeah, not even really, it's just to cover expenses while you're collecting accounts receivables, right? It's to be able to pay your employees, to be able to pay your marketing, pay your rent, while you're collecting accounts receivables. That's all it is, okay? And then total it. Okay. 
questions? Okay. Part 7B, kind of going to look similar, but these are your monthly ongoing expenses. Your rent, utilities, salary including... Yourself. Please don't forget to pay yourself. That's a really dumb mistake to make. The whole point of doing this, like uh, the student said, was to make money, right? So please don't forget to pay yourselves. What else you got? Marketing, insurance, inventory, right? You can't make money if you're not buying things to sell. What else? Okay, and then don't forget that this is for a year. So don't show me your rent for just one month, because you're not gonna be just open for one month. How long are you open for? 12 months, right. So we need to multiply by 12, 12,000. Okay, and then your total is for the year. One million dollars. Questions here. Don't leave out the really important stuff. Rent, salaries, utilities, marketing, inventory, supplies. Um. I was just thinking, like, how are we gonna put this down? Like, do you want us to like put that into words, and that's what you um, or, like, so can you make like a chart or something? Yeah, like that? that would be great. So here, sometimes students will literally just in the word document, they'll just type out all the things, they'll tab over another column, they'll put all their amounts, then they'll put their totals. That's cool too. If you want to do this in Excel, like in a chart, and then just copy and paste it, I'm cool with that. However, you want to make it look. You want to make it pretty with nice borders. I'm cool. The main thing I'm looking for is, do your numbers make sense? Have you left out anything super obvious? And does it total correctly? Okay. okay. And then I'm looking for one other thing, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Other questions, good question about formatting. You guys all know I set up a Word document for you in Jupyter, right? You can literally open that Word document and just start typing. So you don't even have to set up all the headings that are there for you. And okay. then the, um, the example that you have, uh, the business plan is really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. I want to say one thing about that. So that's a real business in Kansas City, Missouri. I've been to it. I'm Claire DeLune. It's an Instant Cacao company. It's great. Use it. Look at it. Beautiful. Do not copy their format because it's different. Okay? You'll see. Their format has like regular numbers like this. Don't copy their format. You can copy ideas from it. That's fine. But make sure you're using my required format. Because okay? you're going to wind up doing other things that I'm not asking you to do. So can we put it by the part one? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Sure. With those headings. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. So I know exactly what I'm reading. I want to know when I've got to part 2A or part 2B. Okay. I need to know where I am. Good question. Cool. Okay. Ready? Very last section. So the balance sheet. All right. So I know you all know this one because if you didn't know it, I wrote it. I hand wrote it for you on your exam, right? Um, and that's the sale, the skeletal profit and loss statement. Okay, so skeletal P and L. Five simple lines. This should be the easiest thing you do. The only people who don't do this are the people who ran out of time because they thought they could do it two days before it was due, and then they realized, oh shit, I can't do this two days before it's due. Um, so here's what it is: sales minus cost equals gross margin minus expenses equals profit or loss. Okay, let's find out where all the numbers come from. Where does the first number come from? Part 5B. Everybody clear? First number, bless you, comes from part 5B. Part 5B, what did I write there? 1,200,000. Okay, that's my sales. That's my, that's my revenue. That's the money I made for the year. That's the money that I am guesstimating that I'm going to make. The plan. Okay? Cogs, where does this come from? A. Or is that an A? Um, well, okay, that's a complicated one. Technically, it comes from Part 7B inventory. Okay? Inventory is really a monthly ongoing expense. Inventory is not stuff you're going to buy one time and never buy again. It's stuff you're buying over and over and over. Okay? So, I'm going to take this number, inventory, and I'm going to put it here. Now, I'm going to say one quick thing about it. How, this comes, how do I figure out what my, how much my inventory is going to be? 
See this business? How much did I make here? What are my sales? One million two hundred thousand. With me? Okay. If I come up with the number like ten thousand dollars, it is not possible to generate a million dollars with ten thousand dollars worth of inventory. It's not possible. Do you understand that? When I was at Bloomingdale's, if we sold something for a hundred bucks, we paid fifty bucks for it. Okay. So this number is going to be maybe half, maybe a little bit less than half of this number. Do you understand that? For every $100 I sell, I probably spent 40 to $50 on that item. Okay, so I'm gonna just make my number easy and I'm gonna say my inventory is 600,000. Okay, half of what I generated in sales. Clear? Okay, if there's a real disparity between those two numbers, Either your sales are wrong or the amount that you're thinking you're going to spend on inventory is wrong. Okay, so the next one is just subtract. Million two minus 600 is 600. Okay, fourth number, expenses. Where does this come from? Yeah, A and B. It's pretty much all the other numbers we have left on the board. Uh, I just subtracted. Literally just subtract. Oh, good, thank you, I didn't say gross margin. And if I didn't say COGS is cost of goods sold, GM is gross margin. Gross margin is just a fancy way of saying the difference between what you sold and what it cost you. Okay, good question. Okay, so you guys, I'm gonna add up all of part 7A, which I already did, and all of part 7B, which I already did, except, Except, don't make this mistake, what have we already used? Inventory. We've already used this inventory number, agree? So don't count it twice, you, you pulled it out, okay? So add up all of your one-time expenses, all of your monthly expenses, but don't count inventory twice. We're pulling this out, okay? So, I'm just gonna come up with a number, a big number. 600 minus 700 is 800, agree? Okay, so if your answer is negative, it's a loss. You don't lose points on this project because it's a loss. Most businesses have a loss in their first year. I'm not looking for you to make a profit, so please don't feel like I've got to massage all my numbers to make a profit, he's looking for profit. No, 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 I'm just looking for realistic numbers, that's all, okay? If your number's positive, it's a profit. Profit or loss. Why do most companies have a loss in their first year but possibly a profit in their second year. Right. This whole list is usually not there in year two, right? So that's why year one, oftentimes it's a loss. It doesn't mean you're not making any money, you're paying yourself. You've already budgeted a salary for yourselves, okay? But year two, sometimes we have a profit, okay? Other questions?